What a crowd. I would like to express my great pleasure in welcoming you to the 2008 Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Lecture. My name is Lester Mons, and I'm the Senior Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. It is my honor to welcome to the campus this year's lecturer, an actor of stage, cinema, and television, and a social activist, Mr. Lou Gossett, Jr. Welcome, Mr. Gossett. I would also like to welcome the audience um, gathered at the Detroit, Detroit Center who are receiving this program via video conference. This year marks the 40th year since Dr. King's assassination in Memphis. In all the years following his death, we continue to struggle to keep his dream alive. Against seemingly insurmountable odds, such as a voter referendum that eliminate the tools to help bring about equality in education and in the workplace, we strive to continue his life's work. Here at the University of Michigan, 2008 marks the 22nd year of the campus observance of Dr. King's life. I'm proud to say that the University of Michigan continues to host one of the nation's largest and most comprehensive observances of the King holiday. Thank you very much. I want to offer a special thanks to those individuals and groups on the campus who have worked very hard to make this year's commemoration a success, and those who have offered a friendly welcome to our guests. First, to Provost Terry Sullivan, who hosted a breakfast this morning for Mr. Gossett, which was attended by a number of deans, executive officers, faculty, staff, students, community leaders, local, state, and national elected officials, including Congressman Dingell and Debbie Dingell. The MLK Symposium Planning Committee works around year-round to organize the many events scheduled over these next weeks. And of course, none of this could have taken place without the work carried out by Associate Vice Provost John Matlock and Ms. Theta Gibbs, Symposium Coordinator. Where are they? Right, let's have them stand. Thank you both. We also have to thank the MLK Day Symposium Planning Committee and the OAMI staff. Are you all here? Planning Committee, would you please stand? OAMI staff. Thank you. We're also pleased to have two members of our Board of Regents, and I would like to introduce them. Catherine White of Ann Arbor. And Julia Darlow of Ann Arbor slash Detroit. <laughs> Thanks to you all. We should never lose sight of the fact that this day is set aside to commemorate the life and work of a great man, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He was a humanitarian whose eloquent oratory has become legendary. Through the spoken and written word, Dr. King acquired the extraordinary capacity to connect with the human spirit, and he is remembered for his courage and the words he spoke while in the most fearful situations. In his short life, Dr. King was instrumental in helping us realize and rectify those unspeakable flaws that were tarnishing the name America. The events that took place in and around his life were often earth-shattering. His life was dedicated to fighting the injustices that formed the foundation of this year's symposium theme. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. In the summer of 1966, Dr. King led demonstrations in white neighborhoods of Chicago. He was accused, as he had been so many times before, of inviting violence with his provocative tactics. In a 1967 interview, he once again gave his response to such charges. He said, we do not seek to precipitate violence. However, we are aware of the existence of injustice in society, and that is the existence of violence, latent violence, he said. We feel we must constantly oppose this evil, even if it brings violence upon us. 
Dr. King believed that injustices must be brought into the open where they cannot be evaded. He felt that every act of injustice mars and defaces the image of God. In his 1963 letter from Birmingham jail, Dr. King asserted, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, it must be uncovered with all of its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must also be exposed, he said, with all the tension its exposure creates. Injustice must be exposed to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. As we push for a transition from injustice to justice, Dr. King believed that justice was the critical issue of earthly life. For him, justice was more than a legal issue, more than a moral issue. It was a spiritual issue. The realization of justice was the realization of God's presence on earth. He asserted, the Lord God is a God of justice. He went on to say, justice is the same for all issues. It cannot be categorized. It is not possible to be in favor of justice for some people and not in favor of justice for all people. Justice, he said, cannot be divided. That is what he said. And we would do well to heed his words as lessons of peace and justice. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 13th president of the University of Michigan and a person leading the charge for diversity and excellence in higher education on our campus, in the state of Michigan, and in the nation, Dr. Mary Sue Coleman. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like all of us to thank Dr. Lester Montz for his thoughtful work in making our campus a better place for all students and faculty. Thank you, Lester. It is a pleasure to welcome the to the community to welcome the community to the University of Michigan's 22nd annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium. We have extraordinary speakers and presentations throughout the day, including one that will begin in a few moments with our keynote speaker. I want to offer the warmest of welcomes to Lewis Gossett, Jr., and thank him for his years of creativity, his talent, and his activism. I know that we are all eager to hear his message. Of course, none of the activities planned for today and the coming weeks would be possible without the diligent work of the MLK Symposium Planning Committee. Please join me again in showing our appreciation to those faculty, students, and staff members for their commitment and many hours of hard work. That hard work includes identifying and exploring a theme for our symposium. This year, we are examining words written by Dr. King when he was jailed in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Dr. King went to Birmingham to protest the segregation that gripped the city. City leaders responded by jailing him. In defending civil disobedience and nonviolent protests, Dr. King wrote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Those powerful words are the theme of our symposium. Members of the Michigan community work for justice every day. It happens through teaching, creating and sharing knowledge, sharpening the critical thinking skills of a new generation. It happens through research that explores how to provide clean drinking water in the poorest communities. It happens by providing free legal services to those in need. It happens through outreach to teachers and students in underfunded schools. What does justice mean to you? Perhaps you see justice as, accessible, as access to reliable, affordable health care, knowing that people will have the treatments, medications, and preventive care that they need to lead healthy lives. Maybe you see justice as environmental equity, guaranteeing clean air and water for families, regardless of where they live or how much their house is worth. You might equate justice with the way that our nation addresses immigrants or levies taxes or funds education. Justice is inherent in the monumental affairs of state, 
and also in the decisions we make and the actions we take every day. In one way or another, you have a voice in all of this. Each of us, as individuals, can influence the issues that affect all of us as a society. We can think, we can engage, and we can vote. Regardless of the political badge we wear, we have an obligation to be educated, engaged citizens, and participate fully in the democratic process that is the foundation of this country. For many of our undergraduates, this November represents the first opportunity to vote in a presidential election. Everyone can tell you about their first presidential election, who they voted for, and why. It resides in the same box of memories with getting a driver's license or buying a beer for the first time legally. <laughs> in addition to our selecting the next president, voters in 2008 will show their support for U.S. senators and representatives, local officials, and ballot initiatives. Each and every vote cast has the power to shape the course of justice in our community, our nation, and beyond. Dr. King knew this and worked diligently to secure the right to vote for African Americans in the Deep South. In leading the cause that would result in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, he showed America and the world the ugly truth of poll taxes, literacy tests, rogue sheriffs, and immoral public officials. He knew that a vote cast by one person could affect the lives of many. When the full power of the ballot box is available to my people, he wrote in an essay, it will not be exercised merely to advance our cause alone. He continued, quote, we have learned in the course of our freedom struggle that the needs of 20 million Negroes are not truly separable from those of nearly 200 million whites and Negroes in America, all of whom will benefit from a colorblind land of plenty that provides nourishment of each man's body, mind, and spirit." Unquote. Our nation has moved from fully enfranchising black voters in 1965 to seeing both an African American and a woman becoming leading presidential contenders in 2008. This is remarkable and historic progress. The polling place forever holds the power and the promise to advance the causes we care about as citizens. In 1962, Dr. King stood here on this stage and urged U of M students to involve themselves in the world around them. Education, he said, is being true to studies, yet devoting oneself to a significant cause. Nearly half a century later, that still holds true, and the need for each of us to be engaged in public affairs, in the world around us, and the quest for justice is undiminished. I encourage our students to educate themselves about the candidates and the issues. Immerse yourselves in matters that mean the most to you. And then, volunteer for a candidate. Register people to vote. Organize a political meeting or attend a rally. Raise your political consciousness and act on your beliefs. Raise your voice, because silence is an accomplice to injustice. Dr. King said, life's most urgent question is, what are you doing for others? All of us can answer that question by stepping into the voting booth, thoughtfully engaging in a sacred right, and shaping our world. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to welcome Professor Patricia Coleman Burns, faculty member from the School of Nursing and a member of the MLK Symposium Planning Committee. Patricia. It is my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker of the 22nd Annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Symposium Memorial Lecture. Louis Gossett, Jr. 
was born in Sheep's Head Bay, Coney Island, in Brooklyn, New York, to Helene and Louis Gossett, Sr. At 16, Lou Gossett, Jr. made his stage debut in the school production of You Can't Take It With You. After taking an acting class because of a sports injury, after graduating high school, he attended New York University on an athletic scholarship where he was a star basketball player and where he received his Bachelor of Arts degree. The New York Knicks were so impressed with Mr. Gossett's athletic ability that they offered a professional contract upon graduation from NYC. He played with them briefly in 1958 before choosing to focus completely on his acting career. Since his film debut in the 1961 adaptation of the Lorraine Hansberry play, A Raisin in the Sun, Mr. Gossett has starred in numerous film productions such as The Deep, Jaws 3D, and Enemy Mine, where he received kudos for playing that ugly, ugly lizard. <laughs> Draconian sci-fi character. His role as Gunnery Sergeant Emil Foley in the 1982 film, An Officer and a Gentleman, yes. You know, it showcased his talent and garnered him as an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Yes. We most recently have seen Mr. Gossett on Broadway in the 2002 production of Chicago. But it was his Emmy Award-winning role of Fiddler in the 1977 groundbreaking television miniseries, Roots. Based on Alex Haley's book that first brought Mr. Gossett recognition. He garnered a Golden Globe in 1992 for his work in HBO's The Josephine Baker Story and received the 1998 NAACP Image Award for guest starring role in the series Touched by an Angel. Now this next part is for the young people because I don't think I know much about this. But I think the young people might recognize that Lou Gossett is the voice of the Vortigaunts in the video game Half-Life 2, <laughs> the voice of Free Jaffa leader Jarak in season nine of Stargate SG-1. <laughs> they get it. <laughs> and Lucius Fox and Batman. <laughs> the 2008 MLK Symposium Committee selected Mr. Gossett as the keynote speaker for this 22nd memorial lecture, not only because of his passion for his craft, but also because of his strong belief in positioning individuals in collective communities to improve the quality of life in their respective communities for the future. He serves as a spokesperson and a behind the scenes leader for many charitable organizations. In 2006, Mr. Gossett founded the Eracism Foundation to bring awareness and education to such issues as racism, violence, personal responsibility, productive citizenship, and social apathy, societal apathy. Some 40 years after the 1968 assassination of Dr. King, who more is fitting to bring a message of peace than Louis Gossett, Jr.? In a year when we have an African-American man, 
and a woman seeking the office of the President of the United States, it is fitting that the speaker for a time such as we face in 2008, Lou Gossett Jr., works to erase the systematic impacts of all forms of racism and injustice. History tells us that there was another who was both a woman and an African American who ran for president in 1972, New York Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. Lou Gossett Jr. is passionate about helping people understand, and I quote, the role and significance of addressing historical contributions and their current relevance, and the importance of a connection to the past. The 2008 theme, Injustice Anywhere is a Threat to Justice Everywhere, Dr. King's response from a Birmingham jail in 1963 regarding the pervasiveness of the ugly practice of injustice is still relevant today. Mr. Gossett's work addresses many of these injustices and those attempts to destroy the hopes and the future of our children and of our communities. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. understood the danger of ignoring injustice on any scale, in any location, at any time, and for any reason. He believed that whenever one person takes a stand against injustice anywhere, it gives hope and courage for victims of injustice everywhere. We have chosen Louis Gossett Jr because we believe that he is one person whose example can indeed give us hope and courage for sufferers of injustice wherever they might be found. Please join me in bringing community activist and award-winning actor Louis Gossett Jr. to our stage for the 22nd Annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium Memorial Lecture for 2008. Wow. I'm, well, I'm going to take this lady on the road with me. <laughs> Distinguished uh, members of the uh, dais and uh, Mrs. Coleman, who is uh, out in the uh, audience, uh, friends, students, young people, citizens of America, visitors, etc. Happy Martin Luther King Day. Happy. <laughs> Uh, before uh, I continue on, the man from the sound department wants to know if it's okay. Is it? Can you all hear me? <laughs> Testing one, two, three, four. Is that right? <laughs> so in the back, they want it up a little bit, right? Up in the back. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to uh, take this time to introduce to you my son, whom I'm very proud of, Mr. Sati Gossett. He went to Syracuse University, and when I would visit him in the winter, it's the same as if I would visit somebody in Michigan. <laughs> I hesitated to visit him in the wintertime because if I was on the way to some set somewhere, I'd be stuck and couldn't uh, get out of there. Of course, he knew that. <laughs> so I waited until the sun shined, and I went to see him in, in Syracuse. Uh, I have been thinking about speaking. Uh, so I've been on a speaker's tour for the last couple of years to many universities, and I write and make notes most of the time. But for some reason, I decided not to bring a speech today, not to look down at a piece of paper to talk to you. Because if I don't know it now, I never will. 
forgive me for my emotions today, because times are so very important. I've just come back from South Carolina, uh, stumping for Barack Obama, and this is not a political speech. Because my ego really took place and I saw Barack and Oprah. And I was at Oprah's with Barack, we hugged and stuff. I said, boy, this would be cool. I could go around Detroit and stuff, hanging and be with Barack and Oprah. And that was nothing but ego and you know, self-centeredness. But the, the main issue was to stump for him, which he can't stump for himself, uh, to, to try and, and, and um, fertilize a place so that when he shows up, things are a little bit better. And, I realized that, so South Carolina was one of those difficult places, and every now and then it was only five or six people in a room, and other times there was 150, and then on one evening there was 850. But uh, just to say about this time, 2008, 2009, and further, it is not about, to me anyway, it's not about politics anymore. It's not about Republicans, Democrats. Something seems to be happening larger than that. Uh, it is a spiritual shift, sometimes involuntary. Even though we might think one way and have thought about that for generations in Mississippi and South Carolina, something seems to be forcing us to change our thought process to maybe think that something, a change is necessary. Otherwise, Iowa would not have happened. Iowa would never have happened. Because in my mind, Iowa, huh? <laughs> They'd be lucky if you got 10. <laughs> and look what happened. But the fact that Iowa came out that way made certain people who've been thinking the same way for generations say, uh-oh, maybe we better do something about this. Or the other side saying, oh, maybe there's a possibility. So you've got this yin and yang happening in our country, which to me is extremely exciting. It's extremely exciting because now there's no apathy left. People are taking stands and people are coming out. And once you know, if you have a problem and you live with it and you don't speak it, even in your relationships, in the marriages, your friends, if you have that problem and you live with it and you don't speak, it takes some kind of personality conflict and it grows out of proportion. But soon as it comes out of your mouth and it gets on the table, something else seems to happen. It seems to dissolve and disappear. So, ev so events like Jenna, for example, woo! I, it surprised me pleasantly that everybody would show up to make sure that this can't happen here in America anymore. It's amazing. But then uh, you have Katrina. And I was down in Louisiana way before Katrina because I loved the food. <laughs> and I loved the ambiance and I loved the music. And some of my friends have been my friends way before Katrina. I've been down there during hurricanes before. But Katrina hit and it's the size of which you've never experienced. Uh, and oversized hurricanes and tsunamis and earthquakes. And so I believe, uh, I don't know about you, but I do believe in a man called God. Um, <laughs> So whenever I got uh, big, um, I realized in my life that I can't be but so big, but I'm never going to be bigger than him. And I had a great grandmother. Uh, according to the Bible, she must have been during the crude arithmetic because the Bible started after the slaves were freed in Georgia. Because <laughs> we weren't supposed to read until then, you know. <laughs> but for some reason, everybody got out and started reading the Bible. And uh, so the births and the marriages and the deaths were recorded in this Bible, and her birth was not recorded in the Bible. So the Bible started, what, in the late 1800s? And I remember her when I was on Broadway at the age of 16. So according to a, a bunch of crude arithmetic, that lady had to be approximately 115, 116 years old. And her job was during the exodus from the south to the north, was to take care of the children. It was the matriarch. There was a connective tissue amongst all of us in our family, which is in my system now, which is why I travel with my son and I'm very close to his children and my father, the senior, and his mother, and there was a connective tissue way back so that when I went to South Carolina, 
there were some old cousins that it's amazing. We were prolific, very much like the Cherokees. The Cherokees, I have not met, I've met people from everywhere in America who is part Cherokee somewhere. <laughs> I mean, the Apaches used bows and arrows, and some of, them, some of the Indians used hatchets, but I often wonder what the Cherokees used. Because they made a point, because there's Cherokees everywhere in America. And they just quietly multiplied themselves, but there was a wonderful relationship between the Cherokee and everybody. They had a wonderful philosophy. But my great-grandmother, who took care of us with her hands, and, and she cooked without a measuring cup, and she put stuff in the palm of her hand, and did the cornbread and the cakes, and, and whatever it was, by measuring in the palm of her hand, and washing us and punishing us with her daughters, my grandmother, my great-aunts. There was some, sometimes some 20 of us around the table, which is where I got my boarding house reach because I was going after we all kind of did almost to the death to get that drumstick. But we were punished, we were washed by a matriarch and the elders who could not work. They're obviously too old, but no, it was their job to take care of the young. And so they were not uh, inefficient. They had to take care of the young. That was their job. Anybody who was strong enough had to go out and get a job. Most of the time, it was butlers and chauffeurs and servants of some sort. And they worked hard, and they'd come home sometimes in pain and, and, and frustrated with what was happening in America in the streets. And my mother and my grandmother would come home from their place, uh, kind of helping other people's children, and finally being so tired, but knowing that they had to work and, and take care of theirs. And I was one of those, and then we had to do our thing by taking out the garbage and making sure we were cool, because they had no time for us to be bad. No time for you to be messing around. Today, it seems like these children think that they have time to be messing around. And I'm here to tell you, there is no time for any child in America to mess around. And I'll get back to that point later on. Because my great-grandmother, who never went to school, quote, unquote, who never could spell the word hospital or doctor, for some reason, none of us really got the measles, got a little bit of chicken pox sometimes, the flu, down to a minimum because she would get something out of the yard <laughs> and boil something and put it around our neck. We would be very unpopular in school, but we would ne didn't get sick. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. And then when we get the whooping cough and the polio, which people were having a hard time, she'd get something out of the oven and put it on our chest and by the time we woke up, it was gone. Then there was a thing called three sixes. You know what three sixes means. And black draft and teas and stuff. I, in retrospect, I realize it's really African. That's where it came from, had to come from there. And it's an instinct that is similar to the Europeans when they had to go to their jars and get their stuff to take care of their children and the instincts of people from Latin American countries who had to go and get some of the things that their elders did to save their children, because there was just no money for doctors and hospitals, and maybe they're too far away. That stuff is the stuff that's made of gold to me. I had a, uh, overheard my great-grandmother one day. She was the first, she was the mother of the first Baptist church of Sheepshead Bay. She must have been close to maybe 80 or 90 years old at the time. I hope you don't mind I'm not doing a speech. I'm just talking to you today. That she was sitting in the kitchen with two of her, her friends, two deaconesses from the First Baptist Church. And they, you know, they dipped a little snuff. And so sometimes they thought that this, you know. But one of the ladies said, you know, I, I think I'm getting a little senile and forgetful. I went to get something out of the refrigerator, and I stood there for five minutes before I could remember what I wanted to get out of the refrigerator. The second lady says, I know what you mean. I stood in the doorway of my closet the other day, 
for 10 minutes trying to remember what I was doing standing in there. And my great grandmother said, you ladies, you know you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I'm talking about how old and see now you're getting. I'm at least 10 years older than both of y'all. And thank God, who is it? <laughs> that was Grandma Ray. So she would not remember the names of me and my 17 other cousins, but she really remembered who we, he, who we were and what we did. If somebody went and did something wrong, she would not remember our names, but she'd go, you. <laughs> yeah, you come here. Wasn't you the one that was supposed to do your lunch? Wait a minute. You the one that's supposed to do your and you know you're going to get beat. So <laughs> like this anyway, forget that you young people think you're scared of the cops, huh? This great-grandmother, sitting in a wheelchair, could put the fear of God in us. Because we'd have to go downstairs and get what is called a switch. And we'd have to braid that bad boy and bring it upstairs and make sure it was strong enough, right? And put it in her hand. And then raise, turn around and lower our pants obediently, and then she, I don't know how she learned about syllables because she never went to school. <laughs> but she would go, how many times do I have, grandma, there's only one syllable in half, shut <laughs> up. You got to know we have no time for you to be bad. Times are so hard. And boy, I got the message. And most of us did. Most of us who got the message are alive today, me and my cousins. Thank God for Grandma Ray and Roots. And it was Grandma Ray that Fiddler was in Roots. I was raised in a neighborhood, and I've got a point to make, called Brooklyn after the, the Depression. And there's something about America that when there is a, a Holocaust like the Depression or 911 or a Katrina or a hurricane, everybody seems to drop all their agendas and kind of get together. And America is at its best when we seem to be at our worst. For some reason, everybody helps everybody. I look on television and see the papers, people helping each other out of fires and saving people out of floods. And, and pulling each other and then giving each other mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and, 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 and putting people in their homes that they never would speak to. And, and Katrina was amazing. And so that's, that's America. But all of a sudden, things calm on down. And we kind of go back and lock the doors and say, <sighs> instead of keeping the doors open in our minds and in our hearts for one another, which is, I think, what America was supposed to be like in the first place. They wrote some beautiful stuff. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed with certain inalienable rights. And among those rights, what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then, of course, I find us uh, today, and I see it happening less and less, but it happens, because that's why we got into a certain problem, is that when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, or when we say the Lord's Prayer, or whatever we say, we say it just for the moment and we feel good and then we get up off our knees or out the door and we continue to lie and cheat one another. So then why say the prayer if we don't do the do? The do? So I see a gap between the prayer and the positive action. Even today, and I, I congratulate you for celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King's day and Black History Month but it's more than just the day or the month. It's every day, 24 seven for the rest of time that it must be practiced. Obviously, when we say, uh, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, etc. We got to live that way if we're gonna say it on a daily basis and really mean it. If we're gonna say, I pledge allegiance 
to the flag of the United States of America. I remember when I was young, I used to say pledge allegiance to a flag of Richard Stans. Because <laughs> it didn't hit me, because I thought it was a flag to a man by the name of Richard Stans. That was my Brooklyn accent. But after a while, I figured out for the flag of which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible. 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 With liberty and justice for who? That's what I'm talking about, but I'm not sure whether we practice that on a daily basis. So in my life, I have been so fortunate at the age of 15, going on 16, to be on Broadway in the presence of some of the people. I didn't know they were famous at the time, but I did know about Jackie Robinson. And I knew about uh, Sugar Ray and Joe Lewis, and I had something to be proud of. But as a child, that particular community, fortunately, was the result of, um, of a blacklist. Some of the intellectual creep of the crop of America ran from Senator Estes Kefauver and potentially uh, uh, McCarthy, because they were supposed, and some of the actors, if you remember, the John Garfields, et cetera, if you want to read the history, ran, because they were accused of being left wing. After the Depression, something had to happen. So they were falsely accused, because they were truly Americans. But Coney Island and Sheepshead Bay got the benefit of those professors. They had to change their names from Rosenberg to Ross, and Bloomberg to Bloom, and Schwartzman to Schwartz, and Goodman to Good, and all of a sudden, in kindergarten, all the way up, there were nothing but college professors. I learned Latin at eight years old, and I, I grew up with their children, and that society is responsible for Barbara Streisand, Danny Kaye, Neil Sedaka, Neil Diamond, Arthur Miller, et cetera. That's why there was such a cathartic, artistic, political evolution in New York, because all the teachers were in a concentrated place. So in every subject, there were excels. And in that society, uh, predominantly European Jewish was a thing called a synagogue and a yeshiva. And I would miss my friends in Coney Island and I'd look out and they'd be playing basketball and I'd be there with the Irish substitute school teacher and not really learning much, looking out the window watching my friends play basketball. So I decided the next Jewish holiday, I'm gonna take off. <laughs> so I did. And so I came back and uh, the teacher was looking at the attendance record. He said, Mr. Gossett, uh, you took off yesterday. I said, yes. She said, well, it, yesterday was a Jewish holiday. I said, yes. She said, but you're not Jewish. I said, I know, but I'm in sympathy with the movement. <laughs> Those young men and women who uh, I grew up with in Brooklyn are still my friends today, and they number some 15 or 20 of them. They're still alive, and all of them are in charge of whatever they decided to be. They became in charge of the, the garment district, the politics, uh, uh, theater owners, uh, multi-millionaires of all kinds all around the world. I grew up with them, and they did that. So they learned something in that synagogue. So it occurred to me, what did you guys learn in there? You guys, are, you come out wanting to be chiefs of things and good fathers and, and charge of CEOs. And one guy said, well, we learned that it's a sin not to dream. Imagine our children having a religion where it's a sin not to dream. Whoa, that's a heavy one, you know? So I started to think about it, and I started to think about our young people today. Uh, the thing that really gets me emotional is how many of our young people are shooting one another. And they think that they have found success in, in, in uh, fathering as many children as they possibly can shooting one another, spending at least a year in prison so that they can be men, fill their bodies with tattoos, get enough money they think they can buy everything, and they can show how powerful they are by the externals of their rings and their cars and their clothes, and die before 25. And that's the philosophy. Some of them are future presidents, are future deans, are future teachers, 
incredible future leaders of all kinds, now they're behind closed doors wondering what, what happened. They don't have a synagogue. That synagogue teaching used to take place after slavery in the African home, in the Jewish home, in the Latin home, or in any, everybody's home, by grandma, grandpa, mothers and fathers, because there was no time for you to mess around. And you, got to continue, you have to respect your elders, and this is where you came from, and it's on their shoulders that you stand. And regardless if you don't see that anywhere in the streets, your uncle was the first African-American to act, et cetera, et cetera. He had to walk miles to make sure that you got what you got so you didn't have to suffer. And the connective tissue was there in the home and in the neighborhood. It has been destroyed by I don't know who, but it is gone. So I feel the need for a thing through my foundation called a Shamba Center. The word Shamba is a Swahili word meaning farm. And in that Shamba Center, some of you experts who know about conflict resolution, some of you experts who know about African-American history or Latin history of any kind, some of you experts who know about hygiene, computers, all the things that normally were taught in the home and in the neighborhood must be taught in an organized way inside of a building with high definition television because our kids are not reading today and headsets so that they get taught what is missing. Some of the young people, I see two young people and a father sitting there, that's good stuff. It's so necessary. The number one thing on our planet people think of, and I'll tell you children who are listening to me on closed circuit television, and I'll say it again, and I've said it before, that you are told that the number one commodity on this planet is gold or oil, as pursuit of money, prestige, and glory. That's what it says in the movies. That's what it says on television. That's what you read about in the news, that people die because of possessions and, and crossing of borders and being m militarily mighty and, and, and patting your chest. But I beg to differ. The single most important commodity on this planet are you children. Number one. And what is planted? <laughs> and what is planted in your minds by us, the responsible grown up, is how our future will go. <laughs> it is a natural extension from one generation to another. So I look like the deal might have been early on when we were rapping with. Uh, God, here's the deal. When you become mature and you have children, your number one job is to preserve the planet so that everybody can eat from it, to keep the air fresh, keep the water clear, keep opportunity better so that one generation at a time, and of course, nurture our children so that they can get free health, free love, free shelter, free everything so they can get better than us one generation at a time. And once that deal is done, then you get the keys from God. That seems to be the original deal. Because every time I kind of slip onto that, I seem to get a great life. My, my diseases seem to disappear. I get closer to my children and my grandchildren. And if the number one in my life is to make sure that they are all right and that they don't suffer the harms and slings of arrows of my life, I don't plant any negatives in them, things begin to, lights begin to come on. So now what seems to be happening is God is kind of blowing a whistle, kind of like the referee in a basketball court or the football field. Today, what's obvious, and see, follow me if you don't think so. According to what we read and according to the last Nobel Peace Prize winner, Senator Gore, that uh, the planet is dying. The planet is shaking up. The polar ice cap, where well, the other day uh, a piece of, of, of the polar ice cap fell off, was 35 miles long and 15 miles wide, and it's happening once a week, splashing into the ocean. It affects the weather to such an extent that we have uh, uh, an, alter, uh, an altering of the weather. So in May, you're liable to get a minus five, or in December, you're liable to get, uh, uh, I wish you would have that 80 to five degrees today, but. <laughs> You get my point, 
that something is wrong. The tsunamis are larger than you can ever think of. The, the, the plate under the ocean is, is shaking up. Uh, volcanoes are erupting. The, 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 the rainforest is being depleted, and yet we continue to do the same thing. So I had an image. If that's the number one problem on this planet, then what are we doing fighting wars, lying to one another, ignoring our children, continuing to mess up with the planet, when the number one problem is the salvation of the planet and the number one person who can solve it are our children. It seems like we are all in this 747 airplane and it's at 30,000 30, feet and the plane is plummeting to the ground and everybody inside is now going, I'm gonna be in first class. <laughs> Doesn't seem to make sense. And our children are echoing us. Our children are saying, you cross the street and I'm going to shoot you, I'm going to put a cap in your head. What? And they didn't get that from themselves. Somebody taught them that. So, in conclusion, let's talk about today. 2008, in this primary, where people are trashing one another in politics and promising this and promising that. And I go around and I look at the people I've been to Arizona, the last state, to celebrate Dr. King's birthday. And they filled up a theater, so they've changed. You see what happened in Iowa and California and South Carolina and Virginia. It's not politics today to me. I see an involuntary spiritual shift happening, whether you like it or not. It may not be Barack Obama, but if he loses, you'll never ignore him again. Perhaps he will win, but this is a miracle because it is a miracle only if you can see someone like Barack Obama realistically being considered as the President of the United States or a Hillary Clinton, an African-American with a name called Barack Obama, seriously being considered as President or Hillary Clinton, a woman. I remember the time when women couldn't come in the door. Now they're running things. And it should have been that way all along anyway, huh? Isn't that right, fellas? Without them, there are no, there cannot be any humanity unless we can learn how to live without them. And I'm not going to join you all in that. I can't do without the lady who is responsible, three-dimensional, and she's the mother, as long as I try and act like the father. So now, Back to basics, it seems to me. If this country has incredible promise, it's still the best thing in, there is on the, in the world. Still the best. Because we can uh, object without somebody putting us in jail today, for most part. But we do correct ourselves. We have corrected ourselves. If you step away and look at our history, it's amazing how much we've corrected ourselves racially since slavery in under 600 years. That's a miracle. But of course, those of us who live today are impatient because we want it all. We want that last chain to be off our ankles and our wrists because we don't know whether we're gonna come back. And that's a natural thing because that's me too. I have had a wonderful life as, as an actor, but underneath there were some of those blocks. If it was not for that foundation of my great grandmother, and the, 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 that, that those people who ran from the blacklist who taught me some value systems. And my meeting up with Nelson Mandela and Dr. King and Paul Robeson and Josephine Baker and Jackie Robinson and all those people who came before me without that reverence of the Sidney Poitiers and the Canada Lees. <gasps> Gesundheit. <laughs> I would not stand here today being able to freely speak to you. And I'd like to remind you that you have to represent your children so that when they stand on your shoulders, there is a continuum, extremely spiritual. Now, so now we're on the verge of a finely tuned, multifaceted cultural diamond. We're on that verge to come to the table of diversity with everybody to add their culture to the communal American pot so we can finally become America. So we have to know what we have in our cultural storehouse to add. And it's a crime that some of us don't know because it's not in the movies, which is how I got to this position in the first place. Now that I got the Oscar and Emmy, I wanted to play Kwame Nkrumah 
or the king of the Ashanti civilization and I was not allowed to. And it got to a point where I could either self-destruct or do something about it. And my something about it has come directly to my public and tell them we need to play a little catch up before we get to the table of diversity so that everybody can come to the table with an equal amount of information and history. And if they don't, then it's business as usual. So when we come to that table of diversity, and we talk about our history, our Jackie Robinsons, our Paul Robesons, our, our Sojourner Truths, our Frederick Douglasses, our Dr. Martin Luther Kings, and you can come up with your Cesar Chavez's, and you can talk about all the people upon whose shoulders you rest. When you sit at the American table of diversity, you can do something that's the likes of which history will never have known. It has nothing to do with the Democrats and Republicans. It has to do with God in America. So that once that happens, and we carry our passports around the country and around the world, doors will open up for us again. Because we have to deal with our backyards first. Not the backyards of America, but the backyards of our, our, our souls. And to me, that is back to basics. Uh, so I've got all that stuff on the shelf. But today I will read you a prayer that uh, I normally do it without it, but I'm going to read it to you. Uh, it's never going to be perfect, but it is an aspiration. And some people say, come on, you don't think this is going to happen. It doesn't matter whether it happens, but I have made a personal commitment to try and do this to the best of my ability. Those of you who might know the prayer, because we probably share something in common. Those of us who don't, it is a prayer called the St. Francis Prayer. Lord, make me a channel of thy peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love rather than to be loved, for it is by self-forgetting that one finds, it is by forgiving that one is forgiven, and it is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Martin Luther King had a dream. We must keep the dream alive. It is very much alive in this room. Hopefully it will be alive in your heart. And remember, it's more than Dr. Luther King's day or Black History Month. It is a 365, 24-7 job. So may God bless you all. Thank you for your time and your silence. And you young people, keep the dream going, OK? Thank you, Mr. Gossett, for those wonderful, inspiring words. Uh, Mr. Gossett is uh, available to take just a few questions. If there are any, otherwise I won't go and eat me some barbecue. <laughs> any questions? Over, here. over there. Yes, ma'am. Here comes a microphone for you. Thank you so much for your words today, Mr. Gossett. I I'm sure we all enjoyed him as much as I did. You mentioned your project like the Kwame and, um, Kwame and Krumah mm -hmm. uh, project. Are you doing anything about those? Well, I'm, I'm frustrated. Yes. I'm frustrated. I have 20 projects like that. Uh, okay. uh, 
It's amazing um, uh, because uh, I, I realize I've come to the quote that uh, we do have enough financing and stuff to do independent films. Tyler Perry has taught me that. And where I try to uh, present these things, the answer is always no. Or, well, I'd rather give you the money and, and call the shot for you. And I think it's, it's uh, the African American dollar alone is worth $60 billion a year. Um, uh, they, they, it's wonderful to see Tom Cruise and, uh, and those particular people do their Mission Impossibles and to see uh, Clooney do all of his, his, his uh, Oceans 9, 10, 11 so that everybody gets paid. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could do something with Denzel, Jamie Foxx, Forrest Whitaker, James Earl Jones? <laughs> There's so much to do, and it's the reason why that history is not on the screen that our children don't think they belong. There's a direct connection. So um, what is the answer? I mean, I've got the projects. I need the financing, but then there's got to be distribution. I helped Denzel the other day, by the way, uh, show the screening of The Great Debaters. And he felt in his heart that he's going to be lauded uh, once again for a criminal and the great American gangster and training day. But he wanted people to also know that he's sensitive about a true story about James Farmer and the origin of, of Congress of Racial Equality. And I think that's a better film myself. But now he's made the balance and he's thinking about it. But times have a chance, have a time, things have a, time has a way of, of, we think, slowing down. I guess it's happening at the right pace. But we do have to put on that major high definition screen our history. I want to do that in the Shamba Center. And that's a way to distribute it. Thank you for your question. Good, e or good morning, Mr. Gossett. How yes. are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Oh, great. I'm glad to hear that. My name is Jolyn Lassick. I'm a freshman here at the university as well as a writer for The Daily. And I am wondering, what is your opinion on Proposal 2, which is the um, act that was passed here in Michigan that bans affirmative, ac affirmative action in you know, the university as well as different programs that are funded by the state? Do you think that affirmative action programs are necessary to integrate programs within the United States or just any reflections or opinions you have on the matter? Thank oh, well, I, a lot of people, I get a lot of things on the computer about uh, affirmative action, which I'm a part of, but I think it's a deeper situation now. I think all of that's wonderful, but I think half of our growth, if not more so, belongs to us. So I don't think we need uh, state funding or okays for anything as long as we, in our hearts, on our daily ways, take care of our own. That doesn't mean just black on black. We take care of our children, we take care of ourselves, and we do those things on a daily basis that is much better than an organizing affirmative action committees. I think it's just a personal commitment. So you can pass a law saying you, you don't, you, that you don't discriminate in school, but you gotta put it in the hearts of the people going to school too. So I think it's in the individual hearts to take affirmative action in a personal way, and then it'll grow from there. Yes, ma'am. Hello, thank you for coming today. Um, thank you. I had a hard time deciding whether or not to be here today because I had a call from Detroit and a chance to drive down to Gina, Louisiana today. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my personal volunteer and political work r revolves around rallies and protests mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, things like recovery and rebuild in Louisiana. Um, I'm just. I was very glad when I couldn't go to the march, the, the things that happened a, a month or two ago with all of the activists showing up to Gina mm -hmm. at the time, I couldn't go to that. But I was glad that it was a proactive move to, though it took almost a year that, you know, everyone showed up for that. But when I heard that the KKK was going to be there today, I really couldn't, you know, think about, you know, how we were supposed to handle it. I mean, on the one hand, it was a stroke of genius on their part because so many of African American leaders and, and mentors and um, dignitaries are busy today. Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably so, a, a very carefully thought out plan. And, and I, f I found that there was very little planned to, re to counter them today. Well, very that's... few things were organized. Well, that's OK. I hope so. That... I just wanted to hear your response. Well, I personally am very happy that the KKK is out there. There should be a lot of cameras. I think there should be a lot of cameras and everybody should stand there and watch them and give them the opportunity to express their truth. This is America. 
but I want them to show their best to us, and then let us make decide which kind of America you want. That's America. Show your best. Show your best. You can you speak up, maybe. Okay, you better get up there then. Where you from, brother? Where are you from, sir? Eastern PA. Eastern PA? Muy lejos, hombre. Yes, sir. How you doing, though? I'm fine, sir. My name is Mike Ellison. I'm a member of the Muffet Point Marines. Oh, boy. Simplify, brother. Simplify. All right. God, God bless you. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question is that I'd like to find out what inspired you to do the documentary on uh, the Muffet Point Marines? Well, the documentary, of course, is once again, there's so many stories to tell. One of the great stories that you don't know anything about because you, you saw Flag of Our Fathers, right? Great story. But uh, in order for those men to put that flag up, they called the Munford Point Marines to clear the Japanese out of the caves that were safe enough. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and her husband, FDR, made the, the United States Marines, which is now the most integrated organization in America, give these people rifles, these young men rifles. And they trained them and they trained you hard to go to the, to, to the southeast, to, to, to uh, Mindanao and Iwo Jima and, 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 and all those places to fight. And they made a difference. And the Muffet Point Marines was a separate organization outside of Camp Lejeune. So it was worth a documentary. So you can get that documentary for the for United, for University of North Carolina Wilmington. You can get that in your curriculum to represent these great gentlemen. Another story is a story called the um, Liberators. William Lawrence, uh, well, the Liberators is Bill Burns and Nina Rosenblum. And the Liberators is uh, called Fighting on Two Fronts at Once. And once again, Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, her husband forced uh, General Eisenhower to uh, get these, these, these black men to uh, be military. They had a tank battalion, 369th Regiment and others. To make a long story short, because this is a short day, they beat Rommel in North Africa with the help of the Tuskegee Airmen, and then they were sent on the front of the arrow uh, toward Berlin, and they beat the Panzer Division, and they were out of, out of uh, gas, and they refueled them, and then they went and they rescued the Jews from Dachau, Buchenwald, and Auschwitz. My friend George C. Scott, who played Patton and won the Academy Award, refused the Academy Award because he came to a, a thing at Lincoln Center for the reunion of those Jews and those soldiers. And he did not know it. He just said, well, I didn't tell the proper story, so he didn't take his Oscar. Those men are the men whose shoulders we stand on. Should be major motion pictures. So I applaud you and your Marfa Point Marines. Thank you. for Black History Month, mm -hmm. the Muffet Point Marines. You can give that to my son. He'll take it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That side? You let me know when I can stop. I have to stop, sir. Hi. How you doing? Hello. I'm fine, honey. <laughs> um, in the movie High Lone Somewhere, you play Walter, the father that's lost his family and everything to mm. racial discrimination. I wanted to know, um, the, through, the, your character has like this peaceful demeanor throughout the whole movie. Um, he doesn't really believe in too much violence. Is that, how did you feel about that when you? Well, you wrapped yourself around the character that you play, you know, because uh, I had to change obviously that uh, philosophy to play an officer, a gentleman, and uh, change the philosophy for other characters. So as an actor, you take on, excuse me, the persona of the character. Oh. And then you do it that way. But there's always, it's not uh, cut and dry. It's, we're all complicated people. There's got to be reasons for him to come up to arrive at that kind of demeanor so that uh, you would be impressed by it. It has to do with three dimensions. Okay. Uh, me and my friends, too, also want to know, um, could, like, we get your autograph today or no? <laughs> do you see, well, you know, I really would like to give autographs and take pictures, but if you count how many people are in this room, uh, it's not, it, you'd kill me. I understand. 
if you if you connect uh, with uh, the website, then I'll make sure you get a, a picture, and then I can send. I'll be at home and send it to you. All right, that'd be the best thing to do. Hello. Hi, Mr. Gassett. Um, I just figured since I have the opportunity um, to let to present you with a question. I don't have a question, I have a comment. And I just wanted you to know because um, as I was sitting there, I really, really appreciated you um, standing there and saying, speaking how you felt about God. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel the same way. And I just appreciate you being able to stand there. You know, you've been a media, you've been a celebrity. And to really say that this foundation is based on God. Um, I feel the same way people um, want to know what happened to us and things have changed and we had our forefathers to go before us and our ancestors to fight for us and then look at us, we're shooting and killing each other, um, don't have the desire to go forth in school or do make something of your lives. And it is all about God. When I woke up this morning, honestly, I said, what happened to us? I said, we had Dr. Martin Luther King, we had all, Rosa Parks, all these people go and fight for us, and then look how we're acting. And it's like God spoke to me and said, they've turned away from God. Dr. Martin Luther King and all those other ones had strength and encouragement, and their backbone was me, my foundation. And they turned away from God, and they turned against each other. Mm -hmm. And I honestly believe it goes back to Genesis. God says to um, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, take care of one another, and we've gone far, far from that. And I believe when you say what happened, you know, God is speaking. We have tsunami, and we have 9-11, and people come together, and they show love no matter what race. And then a week later, you're back to your wicked ways, and then something else has to happen for God to bring us together, and God just wants us to stay together. Mm -hmm. I Thank would you. say I Thank appreciate you. it. Oh, one, 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 one. Thank you. You're the last one, brother. I've been waiting for your question. Okay, I'm just going to come out with it, Lou, because, you know, I, I loved everything that you said, and I just have one question. You know, Go ahead. A country that has historically been shaped by supremacist ideology. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give props to the youngsters a lot more than, than folks across the nation have been giving them. What, do you, what can you suggest to youngsters who go out there and fight and raise their voice and do it over and over and have been doing it for some time, but continue to be shut down by systemic policies and institutional policies? Uh, well, you know, you know who was the, the prime example of, of that being done to? Of course, it was Dr. Martin Luther King. And if he taught us anything, it's just there's only uh, barriers upon which we have to go through or over or around. And, it's, and, and our success is based directly, directly, on our belief that we're doing the right thing and our faith that it's going to happen. That's all we need, is the belief that it works and the faith that it's going to happen. There's nothing that anybody in the world can do to change that. So we can talk about systemic everything, and I understand where you're coming from. But the faith and wisdom that it's going to work is the only thing that can destroy any kind of negativity. I think that's going to have to be the last one. Thank you. We want to uh, thank Mr. Gossett for his wonderful speech. Um, it is a real thrill for us to see him and a real delight for us to see him in the flesh after seeing the, work great, the great work that he has done on the stage, in the cinema, and on television. And now we know that he is working equally as hard on uh, social justice and activist issues. Um, before departing today, I want to thank our two American Sign Language interpreters, uh, Lynette Pinkard. <laughs> and Angelique Taylor. And I would also like to thank uh, the, the house crew here at Hill Auditorium uh, for all of the work they do behind the scenes, and uh, Gwen Tandy, who is our coordinator uh, for many of the logistics having to do with the uh, MLK uh, Symposium. Uh, As has been pointed out, there are some 70 events associated with this year's observance, and we encourage you all to take in as many of these events as you possibly can. And don't forget, uh, tonight um, is sold out, but maybe you can come here from the outside if you don't mind standing in the cold, that most deaf will be here on the stage of Hill Auditorium. All right? Thank you all for coming. And Mr. Gossett, thank you again.